Hello and welcome. The topic of this lecture is uh, the theory of well-being known as hedonism. It's the first of several that we're going to take a look at in this course. Um, and uh, just for, you know, uh, FYI, I guess the uh, image here I imagine to be an image of a nerve or a nerve cell, something like that, uh, seems to be appropriate given that hedonism uh, is very much uh, concerning uh, pleasurable and painful experiences. So again, remember um, that uh, hedonism is a theory of well-being. Uh, well-being uh, is sometimes also known as welfare. Uh, so being well, faring well, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, well-being is whatever it is that makes a life good. Okay, so the nature of well-being or the good life uh, has been a primary concern of philosophers uh, since Socrates. It's a major part of ethics. It's part of the sort of sub-area of ethics referred to as meta-ethics often. And uh, it's where we're going to be starting uh, because some questions about what makes a life a good one will matter to uh, other kinds of theories of morality once we start looking at those. There are three mainstream theories of well-being, and I should say something about that. Uh, so philosophers have been at this uh, uh, for a long time, and when I talk about philosophy, I mean Western philosophy here. Uh, there are other perspectives uh, that you could either put into these categories or argue that they deserve other different categories, etc. Uh, but for the most part, when I say philosophy, I mean Western philosophy. It's the kind I'm trained in. I don't mean to imply that there isn't uh, anything else out there or that it's not any good. It's perfectly fine. Uh, it's just I don't know very much about it. Uh, all of my training is in Western philosophy, and so that's uh, that's where I'm going to confine my uh, my contributions. Uh, so in any case, uh, the reason that despite being at this for a long time, we have pretty much three major views is because uh, those are the views that are pretty good. Uh, you know, so one of the things that philosophers do is that when someone comes up with an idea, we tend to try and test that idea destructively. Uh, so, you know, if if there one person comes up with an idea, everyone else's job is to come up with problems with the idea. And if the problems are are too bad uh, for the idea to be any good, we tend to abandon that idea and look for other ones. Um, and you know, we don't really put down ideas lightly. We might be you know mistaken about why the ideas are bad, but in general, the the kinds of theories that that persist, the ones that really stick around in spite of people making a lot of trouble for them, uh, those are those are the ones that tend to be good. And that's that's what progress looks like over time. And so the fact that there really are only about three mainstream views of well-being in, in, in all of Western philosophy. That's that's pretty good. That's a lot of progress. Uh, and, and so uh, hopefully what I want to do here is try and catch you up uh, to some of that, that progress. So the first of these views, uh, the one that we're going to talk about primarily in this lecture, is uh, the view known as hedonism, right? Hedonism, hedonism is the view that the best life is the one with the most pleasure and least pain in it. Right. So this is a term you might have you might have heard used. People you might if somebody calls someone else a hedonist or refers to someone else as hedonist, it's usually not kind of a nice thing to say. And so I should mention that that the modern usage of the term hedonist uh, doesn't really reflect the views of most actual hedonists, like hedonists in the philosophical sense. Right. I mean, words drift in terms of their meaning and usage over time. That's that's that happens. That's normal. You can't uh, you can't stop that. So. These days, in casual conversation, if somebody calls somebody else a hedonist, they what they're doing is they're saying that that person is like like a party animal, you know, like that you know they just sort of throw care to the caution to the wind and they you know uh, big parties, sort of rock and roll lifestyle, that kind of thing. Um, if you put hedonism into a Google search, it'll probably give you like a definition which may include like the philosophical definition. Uh, but I, if I remember correctly, uh, and, uh, among your search results will be a series of like clothing, clothing optional uh, beach resorts uh, that are called hedonism, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, and so, so again, there's that modern usage there. That's, that's not most most sort of ancient and you know even even modern you know proponents of the philosophical view of hedonism are not like no 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 you should like rock and roll all the time. They're more like just is like no no no. What we're saying is that what makes a life a good one is that there are more pleasurable experiences in it. And the reason that you don't necessarily just like go do the whole rock and roll lifestyle thing is because there's also kind of a lot of pain involved in that lifestyle. Um, and uh, you know it's not exactly uh, the, the the best for you. So you know taking care of yourself a little better is going to lead to more steady pleasure in the long run. That 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 sort of thing. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that uh, Russ Schaeferland, our, our, your text author, uh, sort of draws a distinction between attitudinal pleasures, uh, that is the sort of, um, you know, the 
evaluating things uh, well. So having like so when you think of um, you know winning third place in a race or something like that, you know you sort of have this pleasure at the memory, right? It's like that's an attitudinal pleasure, right? Uh, as opposed to physical pleasure, that is you know you eat some ice cream and you're like, oh darn, that's good, right? You know something like that. Um, historically most hedonists don't they just throw all of those things under the uh, under the umbrella of they so they're all pleasures right and uh schaefer landau is a little you know wants to be a little bit finer grained but uh for the most part most ancient hedonists didn't okay so uh when we talk about uh hedonism is 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 a has a long history, right? Uh, in, in the West, it's a, it's a, a very common idea. Um, in some ways, it's an obvious idea, which is why it's so common. You want to say, what makes what would make your life better? He's like, I don't know, more pleasure, <laughs> right? You know, and so it's like, if somebody asks you, why would you want to experience pleasure? You know, to some extent, that almost sounds like a stupid question, right? You'd be like, ah, have you tried it? <laughs> right? I mean, like, so, so there's a sense in which, like saying that, that uh, uh, you know, more pleasure makes a life better, you know, in some sense, that almost seems obvious, right? So uh, that's why the, the the idea is has has been around so long. It's it's uh, it's not a hard idea to come up with. Um, uh, one particular um, uh, uh, sort of famous exponent of of hedonism is the ancient philosopher Epicurus, uh, who lived from 341 to 270 BCE. Um, there are some still you know documents uh, from you know uh, from Epicurus uh, you can read if you just go online. They're very short. There's not very many of them. Um, uh, one of the most famous is his um, uh, letter to uh, Minoesius. So Minoesius was a guy that wrote him a letter and says, "Hey, you know, I want advice on you know how to live a good life." And and he writes back. Epicurus writes back and says, "Well, here's what you ought to do, right?" And uh, it's a really cool it's a really cool letter. Again, very very short. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, uh, Jeremy Bentham also uh, is. Um, you know, these are these are actual, uh, you know, photographs. So uh, uh, Jeremy Bentham lived from 1748 to 1832 CE. We'll uh, sort of revisit him later in the course for other reasons. Uh, he's not only a hedonist. Uh, that's that's his preferred theory of well-being. He also has a theory of morality that we're going to pay a lot of attention to. That is the theory of utilitarianism. Uh, this picture was taken at around 2012 or so. And uh, we'll get to uh, that in a little uh, later in the course as well. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time building up utilitarianism. Uh, number one, because I think the basic idea of it is is just that obvious, right? Why somebody would think that 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 the life with the more pleasure in it's the better one. It's it's it, I think it's a really easy view to understand. Uh, and number two. Schaefer Landa does a perfectly good job, in my mind, of building up the view and explaining what's good about it. And so uh, I want you to make sure to understand that these lectures are not meant to replace the text. They're meant to expand on the text, comment on the text, draw your attention to certain things, etc. Okay, that, that's, what, that's what this is really for. So that being said, I'm, I'm going to take a look now at some objections to hedonism. OK, uh, one of these is one that uh, Schaefer Landa does address, and I wanted to draw your attention uh, to uh, to that particular to the way that he addresses it. Um, and the objection is the evil pleasures objection. Right. And so what he says here is that if hedonism is true, then happiness that comes from evil deeds is as good as happiness that comes from kind and decent actions. Premise two says that happiness that comes from evil deeds is not as good as happiness that comes from kind and decent actions. Therefore, hedonism is not true. Okay, so the the form of that argument is just your basic um, modus tollens, right? Uh, you know, it's it's denying the the consequent, and so it's it's a valid argument. It's formatted properly. If uh, one and two were true. Three would have to be true, um, and so that's fine. Uh, now the question is: Is it is is the argument sound? Is it a good argument? Um, uh, certainly appears to to be so. So again, that's on on page uh, 34 of the Fundamentals of Ethics. And what I wanted to highlight was something uh, about the reply that I, I feel like bears maybe a little bit more explanation if you're not really, really familiar uh, with uh, with logic and logical argumentation. Uh, and I don't imagine that you are. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've just barely started this. And so the, the, the reply here is that this argument, the argument that's on the left there, um, it, it equivocates. OK, uh, that's a, an important sort of word here is equivocates. Th that is. What equivocation is, is when some word or phrase in the argument has a different meaning in each premise, right? And uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of other examples to, to make it make it clear. So if I said um, aspirin is a drug, drugs are illegal, therefore aspirin is illegal. Well, that actually looks like it has the 
form of a valid argument it says a is b b is c therefore a is c <laughs> right uh, i mean so it, it looks valid but but then of course you're like something something's funny there and of course you know what what the funniness is the word drug is being used in two different ways in in, in each premise in the first pl premise um aspirin is a drug uh, the word drug means medicine right or treatment or something like that right that's that's one meaning of the word drug is a medicine or treatment and in the second premise where it says drugs are illegal, well, what you mean is you mean con like legally controlled substances, right, uh, are, are illegal, okay? And so some some legally controlled substances are medicines, but again, the, the word itself is being is being used with two different uh, definitions, right? So so here's um, uh, here's here's another one. Um, uh, uh, this, is, this is one of my favorites. So. Um, uh, the disciples were 12. Um, Matthew was a disciple, therefore Matthew was 12. Okay, this is this is one that's owed to Bertrand Russell. It's a humorous equivocation. Again, the trouble is that there's this notion of were 12, right? You know, um, uh, is is uh, uh, that sort of the was and were are, are, are being a problem here in terms of, of where in the argument they're being used. So when you say that the apostles were 12, okay, um, what you mean is were 12 in number, right? And when you say Matthew was 12, when you put it that way, it seems like was 12 years of age or something like that. And so again, you're using the, the, the phrase in two different ways in two different parts of the argument. So what equivocation does is it makes an argument look like it's valid, without it actually being valid. So, because because here's the thing, um, in premise one, uh, when they say pleasure from evil deeds is as good, right? Uh, the key here is as good for the person who experiences it, right? As pleasure from kind and decent actions. That's true. That's the only way to make the premise true, right? And in premise two, pleasure from evil deeds is not as good morally, right? as pleasure from kind and decent actions. And so again, the trouble is that, the, you know, in, in, in premise two, someone is using the term good in the sense, in the moral sense, morally good. And in premise one, they're using the, the, the good in the sense of, of prudentially good or sort of good for a person's well-being. Uh, and so because it's using the word good in two different ways in the same argument, it makes it look like it's a valid argument, but it isn't actually a valid argument. Uh, so imagine just changing the word good into a, a, a whole different word, right? Just um, said, so, so for example, if the argument was, if hedonism true, is true, then happiness that comes from evil deeds is as prudential as happiness that comes from kind and decent actions. That is, it's, it, it's you know, it fulfills somebody's interests. And premise two, happiness that comes from evil deeds is not as moral as happiness that comes from kind and decent actions, okay? Uh, if you substitute the word good out in both cases, well, now all of a sudden you're looking, it's not a valid argument, right? It just, it's it's like, uh, you know, uh, it says if A, then B, <laughs> if C, then D, <laughs> right? The, that doesn't imply if A, then D, right? That's, it just doesn't get there. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's... Uh, uh, that's a nice, uh, or I guess in this case it would be uh, if A then B, not C, <laughs> and that doesn't that doesn't imply not A. Um, so, so there you go. That's um, that's that's equivocation there. Uh, and uh, please let your instructor me know if uh, you have further questions about how that works uh, or or why that's a defect in an argument. But I, I did want to highlight that a little bit because I don't think. I don't know if, if that one is, is quite as easy to pick up uh, what's wrong with it, uh, just with the way Schaefer Landau describes it. All right, so let's take a look at a second major objection uh, to uh, to hedonism. Um, and this is, this is, again, a very old one. Remember, hedonism is a very old view, so some of the objections to hedonism are also quite old. Uh, and this is one of the most classic, and it's often referred to as the philosophy of swine objection. Right, uh, and uh, here I've I've uh, uh, taken this little bit from uh, a Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry just because it was put so well. <laughs> I was like, well, I can't phrase it any better than that, so I just uh, went ahead and, and cited it and put it here. Uh, this is uh, by a philosopher by the name of Roger Crisp. Uh, the SEP is the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. It's a, an online resource, mostly for it's it's written by professional philosophers, mostly for professional philosophers, uh, but it's a, a really good repository of of basic information and and some not not so basic information too. Uh, so the objection goes this way. Okay, so uh, Crisp explains: simple hedonism places all pleasures on a par. 
whether they be the lowest animal pleasures of sex or the highest of aesthetic appreciation. Imagine that you are given the choice of living a very fulfilling human life or that of a barely sentient oyster, which experiences some very low-level pleasure. Imagine also that the life of the oyster can be as long as you like, whereas the human life will be of 80 years only. If Bentham were right, uh, and other Bentham was a hedonist in this case, uh, there would have to be a length of oyster life such that you really would choose it in preference to the human life. And yet many say that they would choose the human life in preference to an oyster life of any length. Right, so that's how uh, the situation is described. Let's uh, let's let's uh, make this example a little more concrete. So uh, on, the, I've got a couple of just again consider an oyster versus an oyster life versus a human life, uh, and think which one you really honestly would prefer. Um, the uh, photo of an oyster here, I get that I got it from that's from a recipe from Epicurious.com, uh, which is interesting, right? Because it's thematic, right? Epicurus was a famous hedonist, and so there's this Epicurus. So the the word Epicurean has come to be associated with like really like fine dining and stuff like that. Again, Epicurus himself counseled people to eat mostly just bread and water because then when you get some really good food, you'll you'll enjoy it more. And otherwise, like you just you know, it, Epicurus thought a life of simplicity really was the life with the most pleasure in it, and it's because it was the life with the least pain in it, right? Uh, but anyway, let's so so that's where the uh, so we, just imagine an oyster, okay? Uh, now compare this to uh, the life of, of a human. I've, I've picked one of my uh, very favorite humans. This is uh, Hans Rosling. Uh, you can you can look him up. I very much encourage you to do so. He lived from 1948 to 2017. Um, uh, I was very very upset when he uh, when he passed away. I mean, we all do, but it was um, he was he was great. Uh, so in any case. Um, uh, imagine again, he lived 69 years. Okay. And so imagine that a human being, uh, you know, a, a really good human life, right? And, and I, I imagine, I certainly hope, right? Hans Rosling lived a very good, pleasurable human life. Uh, let's call that 10 hedons of pleasure per year. There's no actual, this is just a made up unit, right? Um, there is no real actual unit of pleasure. We're just going to do that for the sake of discussion. So imagine again, he on average had, you know, got 10 hedons of pleasure per year of his life. And so if you take that time, six, that's 690 total hedons of pleasure in his life. Right. That's, again, a good human life, uh, let's say. Well, now let's uh, uh, look at the oyster. OK, the oyster uh, gets gets a half a heat on uh, per year. Right. A very low level pleasure. OK. And it's very simple. Right. You know, it's like maybe the pleasure of just a little bit of cold water flowing by. I don't know. Right. But the idea is, you know, about a half a heat on per year on average, that that's an oyster's life. Uh, and it's a very simple pleasure. OK. And so. Imagine, though, that, that this oyster gets to live for 1,382 years. Well, 1,382 times 0. 0.5, that's 691. Okay? So it seems like if you're going to be a hedonist, if you're going to say that the better life is the one with the more pleasure in it, you're going to have to say that that oyster led a better life than Hans Rosling. And there's something about that that seems very bizarre. Uh, bizarre enough that that it has caused a number of people to say, ah, I just, yeah, I get that. That hedonism is just is just false then, right? But you might think, well, if it was that easy, <laughs> then why would there be any hedonists? Well, that's that's good thinking. Hedonists do have a reply, and one famous hedonist is this fellow here pictured. This is John Stuart Mill. He lived from 1806 to 1890, or, sorry, 1873. Um, and, and his reply was this. He says that the quantity of pleasure is not the most important thing, even if pleasure is the most important thing. So he is a hedonist. He's just, uh, as we, we might call a qualitative rather than a quantitative hedonist. He says uh, that some pleasures are of higher quality than others. So he says it's not just a simple matter of totaling up all the pleasure. Uh, there are some pleasures that are just better than others, and that's why you know it's better to be. You know, so he, he puts it this as just a direct quote from him. He says, uh, "Few human creatures would agree to be changed into any of the lower animals in return for a promise of the fullest allowance of animal pleasures. That is, we wouldn't pick the oyster. No intelligent human being would consent to be a fool." No educated person would prefer to be an ignoramus, and no person of feeling and conscience would rather be selfish and base, even if they were convinced that the fool, the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his life than they are with theirs. 
right? So another sort of famous uh, phrase he'll bring up, he says, better to be uh, a pig, or he's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Okay, and so th this is a proposal. Uh, not all hedonists accept this. Um, uh, his, you know, sort of, uh, uh, well, actually Jeremy Bentham, who he's arguing with here, Bentham is a very much a quantitative uh, a, a hedonist. Um, uh, Bentham was also uh, John Stuart Mill's godfather, right, and and uh, and uh, a teacher and a really good friend of his of Mill's father, uh, James Mill. Uh, so it's very 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 close relationship, even though they disagree about this issue philosophically. Um, but uh, but th this is it, it, it's an avenue, right? And so one way of of maintaining hedonism in spite of the philosophy of swine objection is uh, to insist on a difference in qualities of pleasures, not just their quantities. It, it's it's a real view. But again, not all hedonists uh, accept that. And some uh, some hedonists, like for example Bentham, might just say, well, look, you know, more pleasure is more pleasure, right? If you really could be an oyster that gets half a hedon a year for thirteen hundred years, yeah, you should take it. It's more pleasure. Are you kidding me? And so you know. Sometimes they'll just bite the bullet, um, but uh, it's a uh, the philosophy of swine objection is a very important one historically and has led uh, the, the hedonism in, in a couple of different directions. Perhaps the most famous modern objection to uh, hedonism comes from this fellow here. That's Robert Nozick. Uh, he uh, uh, was a, a professor of philosophy at Harvard University for a long time. Uh, he lived from 1938 to 2002. Um, and uh, he was the, the one that uh, is credited with coming up with this objection. And it's a very short, it's one of your readings. Um, but uh, it goes something like this, right? It says, um, imagine that I have a machine that I could plug, plug you into for the rest of your life. This machine would give you experiences of whatever kind you thought most valuable or enjoyable, writing a great novel, bringing about world peace, attending an early Rolling Stones gig. You would not know that you were on the machine and there's no worry about its breaking down or whatever, right? The reason that's in there is just to make it a good thought experiment. Would you plug in? Would it be wise from the point of view of your own well-being to do so. And again, Nozick thinks it would be a big mistake to plug it in. He says, we want to do certain things. We want to be a certain way. Plugging into an experience machine limits us to a man-made reality. Okay. And so uh, this is a, as a compelling objection, uh, and a lot of people have regarded it as um, an absolute knockdown argument against hedonism. Uh, they can't imagine why anybody would be a hedonist in the face of this argument. Uh, but again, the hedonist has some reasonable reply. I think it is a, a very a thoughtful and interesting uh, 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 objection uh, to hedonism, uh, even if I'm, I'm myself not particularly convinced by it. Uh, and so what I want to do is wanted to discuss some of the replies uh, that the hedonist can make uh, uh, against uh, uh, this particular objection. So one of those is is, is the following, right? One of them is, is uh, what you might call the epistemic reply, right? Uh, the reply about your knowledge. So imagine this, uh, uh, and I've just got this sort of, you know, uh, picture on the left that I, I think more or less explains it all. Um, would you know if if you were in fact living your life inside of that machine or not right if like you you could have been in that machine from the time you were born um or had your memory erased beforehand and had new memories but whatever right i mean like there's a sense in which it's at least you know within the realm of 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 uh, imaginability right there's no logical contradiction in it you could be just a brain in a jar that somebody else is just feeding experiences to okay so that is you could be in in Nozick's experience machine right now but it doesn't actually seem to affect you choosing pleasurable over painful experiences right it doesn't seem to affect the idea that that you you know you yourself when you make decisions tend to choose the ones that are you know more pleasurable and you tend to avoid the things that are more painful and you tend to think that that makes your life better that sort of thing right so um there's a sense in which uh you know this this notion of you know whether your experiences are quote unquote real uh you know doesn't, doesn't make a difference uh so in any case that's you know um it, it hedonism may be the right view whatever our actual existence is, whether it be in a in some kind of a machine or isn't. But I wanted to say uh, a, a one other thing about about this aspect of it. I think that that the experience machine objection trades on something other than hedonism. I think what happens is that Nozick says, "Would you rather be live a lie or something that's true?" Right. Instead of saying, do you really think that pleasure is what makes a life a good life uh, or not? And so what I think has happened is that people say, well, no, 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 I don't want to live the lie. Therefore, 
you know, because this lie is pleasurable, that must mean I'm not, uh, you know, choosing choosing pleasure or something like that. And I think that people get too distracted. So if you think of it uh, another way, if you say, um, imagine pushing a button and then, you know, having that some machine actually change reality itself to actually be really pleasurable for you, would you do that? And it seems like all of a sudden Nozick's objection just disappears. You'd be like, well, yeah, you'd be an idiot not to push the button if it would magically sort of alter the world to make everything pleasurable right you know uh like maximally pleasurable it's like well no that would be that would be great right it'd be the greatest button ever made um you, you know we should make such a button uh, or something like that but i think uh, the other thing i wanted to sort of take issue with is that nozick assumes incorrectly that computers or machines can only simulate things and, I, and I, to some extent, you have to consider when this was written, right? The kinds of, you know, machines of his day were not as capable as the machines of ours, so maybe it was harder to imagine this sort of thing. Um, and so he argues incorrectly that a computer caused experience is a simulated experience, that is, it's in some sense a lie, right? Um, and, and and we still, I think, a lot of times think this way and talk this way, and it's not it's not right, okay? Like, the source of the experience doesn't actually affect the reality of the experience, Right. So I'm sure almost all of you, if not all of you, have played a computer game or a video game of some kind. Now, when you so let's let's say Pac-Man. Right. I mean, even if you haven't played Pac-Man, you know Pac-Man. Right. So imagine you played Pac-Man. Did you really play Pac-Man or did you only simulate playing Pac-Man because there was a computer involved? It's like, well, no, you really actually played Pac-Man, right? So say you lost on the fourth level. Well, that's true. That's a thing that really did happen. You really did interact with the machine in such a way that you lost on the fourth level, right? Um, you know, your last Pac-Man got eaten by a ghost or whatever, right? That's, you know, that's a, that's a real experience you really had, even though the source of the experience, right? And so like if you were unhappy about, you know, losing on the fourth level, you really were unhappy. I mean, that's, again, that is a real reaction that you actually did have, even if the cause of it was something electronic. And while we're, we're on it, the electronics are real things, right? The, 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 your video game system is a real computer with information really stored on actual physical memory devices, right? Whether they be on a cloud somewhere or on your local machine, it's still, there's still a physical memory somewhere that's physically storing that information. There are electrons zipping around. There are actual radio waves, you know, zipping between your controller and your device or whatever it is, however you're using it. Like all of the, these are all real things that exist in reality right the experience machine is a real machine that is making your real brain cells actually react in real ways and so this idea that it's all oh, it's all a lie or whatever that's that's not sufficiently thoughtful um and that's distracts from 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 the the actual issue and so one of the things that has been remarkable about uh, you know recent time a time uh, you know sort of long since this kind of an argument was made is that that we've started to take the idea of living in a digital environment uh, much more seriously uh, in fact as you know in the last few years i've read more than one book that is primarily concerned uh with uh living in a, a sort of a with a something like a, a digital afterlife uh, if you have seen the amazon series upload that's you know same thing right so you know uh, involving a digital environment and i think it's getting easier for people to understand that you know even if you're living in a digital environment you're you're still living in an environment. You're still having experiences. They're still your experiences. Um, and it matters what kinds of experiences those are. And so it may be that, that Nozick's experience machine um, uh, d doesn't, in fact, uh, uh, really have, it be, doesn't contain a, a very good objection to hedonism. Because the idea is if, if you were going to live in some digital environment, wouldn't it make a difference what kind of environment it is, whether it was a pleasurable one or a painful one? And if you say, well, no, a pleasurable digital environment would be much more uh, beneficial than a, you know, a painful digital environment, well, then maybe hedonism's right after all. Um, and that this difference between, uh, you know, living in the machine or living outside the machine just really wasn't all that important after all. Uh, so yeah, these are these are two of the the novels in question. Uh, one of them is Neil Stevenson's novel Fall. Uh, the other is uh, uh, Ernest Klein's book uh, Ready Player Two. Um, uh, both of which are actually sort of indirectly sequels of the books that came before them. Um, I would say you don't necessarily have to have have, have read uh, the uh, uh, Reemdy to read Fall, uh, and but you probably should read Ready Player One before reading Ready Player Two, uh, just if in case you're curious. Uh, good books though, I'd recommend them. Okay, so uh, I, I want to mention one 
other objection to hedonism that the text doesn't really mention, um, but I, that I think is is pretty compelling, right? Um, so this one uh, comes from some of the work done by a psychologist by the name of Daniel Kahneman. Um, if you're curious about Daniel Kahneman, he's sort of a giant in his field. Um, and uh, he did a lot of work with uh, another psychologist by the name of Amos Tversky. Uh, Tversky has, has uh, uh, passed on some years ago, uh, but Dan, Dan Kahneman is still still alive, still working, uh, still doing very, very interesting things. Um, uh, so he's written a number of books. I'd recommend all of them. Uh, and uh, there's a book about himself and uh, Tversky called The Undoing Project by uh, Michael Lewis. And it's, it's a really good biography of, of that work. So I'd, I'd recommend that if you're interested. So here's the way, here's, here's, here's the way it goes. Here's what Dan, Dan Kahneman says. He's going to set up this notion of a distinction between what he calls the experiencing self and the remembering self. And so here's what he says. He says, um, there is a confusion between experience and memory. Basically, it's between being happy in your life and being happy about your life. And those are two very different concepts. There is an experiencing self who lives in the present and knows the present, is capable of reliving the past, but basically it has only the present. It's the experiencing self that the doctor approaches, you know, when the doctor asks, does it hurt now when I touch you here? And then there's the remembering self, and the remembering self is the one that keeps score, maintains the story of our life, and it's the one that the doctor approaches in asking the question, how have you been feeling lately? Or how was your trip to Albania? Or something like that. Those are two very different entities. Okay. Uh, this is uh, uh, from a, a, a TED talk that was given uh, quite a number of years now ago by uh, Dan Kahneman uh, called The Riddle of Experience versus Memory. If you want to see the whole thing, I, I'd recommend it. But uh, this is, I, I've quoted the bits that are most directly relevant to us. So he continues, right? He says, now the experiencing self lives its life continuously. It has moments of experience, one after the other after the other. And you can ask, what happens to those moments? And the answer is really straightforward. They're lost forever. I mean, most of the moments of our life don't leave a trace. Most of them are completely ignored by the remembering self. And yet somehow, you get the sense that they should count. And that what happens during those moments of experience is our life. It's the finite resource that we're spending while we're on this earth. And how to spend it would seem to be relevant, but that is not the story that the remembering self keeps for us. Very, very interesting, very insightful uh, piece of, honestly, philosophy here is what he's doing when he's uh, answering this kind of a question. And so you'd think that if hedonism were correct, that the, that the life with the more pleasure in it would be the better one, and that like the experience of happiness is what makes a life a good one, then we should expect experiences to be more represented in how we evaluate our lives. But really, when you think about it, most experiences are not remembered at all. As he puts it, they, they leave no trace, right? And so I don't know, maybe that moment to moment experience really isn't what's actually important in a life. That, that's a possibility. Uh, let's continue on. Kahneman here presents uh, this little thought experiment that, that is really compelling. So he says, I want you to think about a thought experiment. Imagine that for your next vacation, you know that at the end of the vacation, all your pictures will be destroyed and you'll get an amnesic drug so that you won't remember anything. Now, would you choose the same vacation? And if you would choose a different vacation, then there is a conflict between your two selves, and you need to think about how to adjudicate that conflict. And it's actually not at all obvious, because if you think in terms of experiences, then you'll get one answer. And if you think in terms of memories, you might get another answer. Why do we pick the vacations we do is a problem that confronts us with a choice between the two selves, that is, this experiencing self and the remembering self. Right? I mean, I don't think anybody goes to Disneyland for the experience of standing in a line forever. They go there to have the memory of having gone to Disneyland, right? And so, in a sense, most vacations are chosen on account of anticipated memories. They're the, the thing you look forward to remembering rather than for the experience itself, or at least not purely. 
Um, and it's possible that a vacation is sort of a microcosm of a life in this sense. It's a, a useful thought experiment. If pleasurable experiences are not the most important thing to how good a vacation is, then perhaps pleasurable experiences aren't the most important thing to how good a life is either, right? So uh, is is a super pleasurable vacation that you then forget about, don't have any pictures of, etc. afterward, is that actually something that makes your life any better? Hedonism would seem like it would have to say it does. But it seems like it might. the right answer might be no, <laughs> such a vacation wouldn't make my life any better. Um, you know, it would just be a big blank spot and that's all, right? And so maybe maybe something other than pleasurable experiences uh, are the thing that makes a life a good one. So uh, very, very interesting to think about. Um, uh, but of course, uh, I imagine that hedonists have uh, some reasonable replies uh, to this objection as well.